All right, welcome to uh, the Michigan Debate Cam webinar on immigration, the Immigration Detention Affirmative. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, this lecture is uh, brought to you by the Michigan Debate Camp and will be given by Kurt Pavelski, who is the Assistant Director of Debate at the University of Michigan and a faculty member at the 2020 Michigan Debate Institute, uh, which will be held online this summer. If you have additional questions or want to see some additional content, feel free to check out our Canvas page or michigandebate.com um, for additional information. Um, so I will let you take it away, Kurt, and then we will do a question and answer session when he's finished with his lecture. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm excited to talk to you tonight. I think that this is a pretty good affirmative. Uh, it has a few fatal, fatal flaws uh, in my mind, uh, and we'll talk about those, but by and large, they can be worked around and is something uh, that many people will probably read at some point during the year. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to hit the Q&A uh, button and go ahead and ask them. So this app is an easy to execute app in a lot of ways. Uh, first, being negative just won't be easy. Um, there's a few arguments that can be read pretty compellingly against it. Uh, I think primarily T, uh, but mo any policy strategy is going to be difficult because of the moral high ground the affirmative has. Uh, and that is just that the vast majority of people who are seeking uh, asylum are coming from horrible conditions in Central America uh, and hardly any of them have criminal records other than being in the country illegally. Uh, for people who don't necessarily debate on the, the national circuit or have or more frequently have lay judges, I think this will also be a pretty easy app to execute because of the issue salience that existed about a year ago. Uh, in terms of the amount of press that was generated about these immigration detention centers. Uh, so it's probably useful to uh, also look and think about what's happening in these immigration detention centers. Uh, here we have a short video uh, inside of one. Should be noted that it's pretty difficult for the press to record or interview people inside uh, because uh, of a great deal of secrecy. Anytime press comes in, their cameras and cell phones are usually confiscated. Uh, so these holding cells uh, are often meant to hold 20 people. Uh, instead, we'll hold 70, 80 people. Uh, conditions aren't that great. As you can see, the, the blankets that people have are, are just tinfoil. Um, not really a place where you would, you would want to spend much time. Should also be noted with the, the frequency at which children are separated from their families at these centers, uh, often with children having to raise other children. But these aren't like teenagers raising other children. This is a seven or eight year old helping raise an infant who doesn't have, has not been provided diapers uh, or other appropriate toiletries. Uh, so pretty harrowing and, and difficult stuff. Uh, you should be careful with the videos that you often watch with them uh, because they can they tend to be a little bit uh, triggering. Uh, so what will a 1AC look like for this? Uh, my guess is uh, the most common version of it will be something akin to what people who debated on the immigration or education topics were, were used to, which would be a couple cards about the conditions and then a large framing section. I'm not really the biggest fan of framing contentions, uh, but I do think that's something that you'll have to deal with. Uh, they'll probably usually highlight the what is happening in these immigration detention centers. Uh, so there's 200 of them around the country. Uh, on average, they service 50,000 service uh, loosely using that term, 50,000 people per day, uh, in total to about half a million per per year. This is a, a great uptick since 2016, uh, uh, pretty much doubling the, the amount of people that are involved in it. 
Um, there's some force factors that are driving people away from uh, their, their home countries uh, towards the United States, as well as some pull factors. Uh, the first, the, the force factors are that in a lot of these countries, there's a great deal of violence. Um, and as the former Secretary of Homeland Security in the US has put it, uh, the house is burning and people are just trying to escape the problem and leaving their home countries for any hope uh, of relief. So the, the big countries that we see migration coming, uh, despite some of the media portrayals, uh, are Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. And as you can see with this chart on the right, uh, they have pretty high homicide rates uh, back then. Uh, this is not, you know, some news outlets kind of made it as like a easy migration path that people are taking, just hopping on buses to come up to, to the US, but that's not, uh, not necessarily the case uh, and certainly shouldn't be uh, that way. Uh, these people often have to go through grueling conditions uh, to uh, get up here. Uh, the poll factors are some economic realities uh, and better, better work conditions that are made available by being in the, the United States. Uh, in 2016, or up until 2016, the Obama administration also tried to relieve some financial pressures that were felt in Central America. Uh, there was a drought uh, as well as a collapse in coffee prices at the same time that just led to a great deal of economic instability in the region. In 2017, under the Trump administration, those programs were axed, uh, which makes it pretty, pretty difficult. So I imagine many 1ACs will kind of talk about the harrowing factors that go into uh, people migrating into the U.S. and then once they get here, they're put into prisons as a result. Uh, another big thing that will be talked about and should be talked about with these apps uh, are the private prisons that are used um, for this. So just a brief background on private prisons in the U.S. They start in the 1980s, uh, but they don't really have many people in them. Uh, after 9-11, they take off uh, because of Homeland Security money that's made available. In 2008, states are looking to defer some of the costs of law enforcement. Uh, and that's where we see a massive uptick in the amount of, uh, m amount of private prisons. Uh, according to the federal government, uh, G the GEO group receives more taxpayer dollars for immigration detention than any other ICE contractor. In 2017 alone, they received $184 million. Uh, and then there's the Correction Corporation of America and Core Civic, uh, which received $135 million that year for immigration detention related services and obligations. So these aren't uh, small amounts of money. Um, only five companies own detention facilities for, for migrants. Uh, and you can see the growth rate that's occurred over the, the last few years uh, through, through this. Uh, treatment in these places are, are pretty pretty grave. Uh, every year, there's about 20,000 grievances that are filed by detainees. Uh, most are not, most are unheard or not followed through on. Uh, this includes abuse, solitary confinement, uh, fatalities, and suicides. And we'll talk about it in a little bit. Uh, it also has to deal with disease spread, uh, and it's pretty, pretty horrible. Uh, so where are they? Um, Louisiana is the private prison capital of the world. Uh, but the bulk of the immigration detention centers are all around the country. Um, as you can see, many in the Southwest, California is a pretty notable place uh, and it will be for the state's counter plan. Uh, and ICE pays around $75 per day per day t detainee in these facilities. Again, there's 200 of them uh, around the country. So you might also be wondering, uh, how does this happen? It seems pretty horrible. Um, maybe there's not much much going on, uh, but there is a revolving door and a great deal of campaign donations that are going through. Um, so the GEO group gave money to a Trump super PAC uh, in 2016, a few hundred thousand dollars, uh, and them and Core Civic helped pay for his inauguration. Um, they're not alone. Democrats also got some money, uh, but in that election cycle, they only received thirty six thousand um, dollars. People that are in Trump's cabinet also receive donations uh, along the way uh, for, for different elected positions. And they seem to have uh, bought in their way, uh, bought in quite a few politicians in the process. Uh, lobbying efforts have been strong. Uh, the GEO has spent $5 million alone 
uh, in the last few years on such efforts, with most of that money aimed at the Appropriations Subcommittee on Homeland Security. Uh, but you know, for a few hundred thousand dollars, you can profit pretty massively uh, by then having contracts that are worth upwards of two hundred million dollars a year. The GEO is worth uh, something something like two point five billion dollars as a company. Uh, in this process, particularly over the last few years, the Trump administration has inked long-term contracts with these organizations. As they've had the chance to expire, uh, anytime between after 2020, they have uh, inked long-term contracts between 10 and 15 years, uh, which maintains some space for for them. Uh, I think that international law will be an advantage that some people some people read, uh, maybe not the most common, um, but uh, this is the head of the UN, UN's Human Rights Council. Um, and she has said that these things are a uh, huge violation of international law because of the way that we treat people. Uh, and this is not how migration should work. Most of the time, these advantages are pretty meh it, just because they start off with trying to solve some impact related to international law. And it turns out the US violates international law pretty pretty frequently. Um, but I think it is possible to win that the US will regain moral high ground uh, through, through ending these prisons or closing them down or changing the treatment at the very least uh, with the way that the Chinese are treating uh, the Uyghurs in Western China. Uh, there's quite a few articles that say that China will point to the US as an example as to why they get away with these detention camps and it, it does make sense that it'd be hard for the U.S. to make much of the way of pressure at the U.N. Security Council or in other international fora if they're receiving backlash uh, for what's happening in the American Southwest. Uh, COVID-19 is something that I found a few articles over the last few weeks uh, that just say we should close these immigration detention centers uh, because the virus will spread. Um, many of you are probably aware that Rikers Prison uh, in New York has seven times higher rate than anywhere else on the planet of COVID-19. Uh, but there's no testing that's happening at all in these detention centers for us to know uh, what's occurring. Uh, last week, I believe it was in Alabama, somebody was brought in with symptoms uh, and detainees asked for, for that person to be quarantined. Instead, the guards threatened violence to those who, to the other detainees unless they were silent. Uh, as one put it, uh, burials are probably cheaper than deportation. Um, and many people within the science community worry that this is just a tinderbox that is about to about to take off. Um, so there could be a great deal of people killed uh, because they're held in confinement trying to reach the US. There's one big court case that relates to this and I think that it will be the one that people cite as in their, their plan mechanism. It's Nielsen v. Preep. Uh, this is a case about the word when in 8 U.S. Code section 1226. Um, there's two big statutes in this, this law that are important to, to think about, A and C, um, and both relate with how the government can hold, hold people before a bond hearing. A says anyone may, may be removable while pending a hearing, uh, and C, which is the one that's listed on the slide, uh, says the government must make, detain people who have a criminal record when they are released as soon as they leave criminal custody. Uh, this is how they get brought into the detention centers and are held. Uh, the issue is, can the government hold people before a bond hearing has ever occurred? Um, according to Justice Alito, who wrote the majority opinion, uh, the answer to that is, is yes. Um, I also think that this is an important uh, section from the majority opinion because it talks about uh, the role of sentencing courts uh, and I think that's probably the area where the the affirmative will get some headway on on topicality. So is it topical? Um, I think that the two routes that you can can take this is through policing and in sentencing um, and just a second I'll show a slide uh, that kind of deals with the policing uh, segment of that. But the more important uh, I th delineation that I think the affirmative is going to have to win is that there's a distinct distinction between criminal justice and immigration justice. And this Rio 2019 piece of evidence 
uh, from a law review is, is pretty good at delineating the distinction between the two, uh, that residents of the United States are privy to criminal law and immigrants to the United States are privy to immigration law. Uh, but because there's so much overlap between the two, it seems like it'd be feasible for the affirmative to win, uh, win some of those arguments. So how does policing work? Um, the, the way that I would see some affirmatives being is just stop having, allowing people to be arrested or forcing police departments to arrest people for violating immigration statutes. Uh, basically make the country into a large sanctuary city um, and adjusting the way that the police approach, approach the law. Uh, here in Ann Arbor, uh, three years ago, I guess it was now, there, the ICE agents came into a restaurant called Sava's, probably many of you have eaten at it during the camp, um, ate breakfast and then went into the kitchen and started detaining people. Uh, pretty cruel strategies for how to, uh, to approach all this. Um, but there's a good chance that according to this Davis evidence that I believe Cahern cut, uh, there's, a, there's a distinction that says this is not necessarily what policing uh, would involve and the necessary uh, rules of sentencing. So a, a little bit of evidence if you wanted to make uh, policing the angle for the plan text that you would have to take. Uh, sentencing reform is probably the, the better way to do it. Uh, here's a piece of evidence from Dehite, uh, this rights and 11 evidence uh, that says that we, there needs to be wholesale changes uh, to, to, the pro to the process. Uh, so if you were to overturn Nielsen v. Preep, I think that you will uh, therefore have changed the, the sentencing process uh, at least from Justice, Justice Alito's perspective, which would, would be good enough. Uh, but uh, a few more pieces of evidence either way uh, will probably shape the way that a lot of people think about this debate. Uh, so some negative positions that will uh, commonly be read. Uh, first is the, the economy DA. There's a lot of places where these prisons are the largest employer for hundreds of miles, uh, particularly in the South. Uh, this means that they're not just employing people, but they drive property tax income, which can be used to pay for school districts um, and stuff like that. Many of you might live in areas where there's casinos. Uh, they kind of operate in the same way. You know, they maybe not the best thing for the economy as a whole, but they generate so much money for a tax base uh, that's worthwhile. Uh, and in many areas, the little league teams and other sports leagues are just funded by these uh, by these detention centers uh, and pretty, pretty difficult. Uh, Econ DA though will have probably quite a few, few problems. It's going to be difficult to think of reasons as to why the rural Alabama economy is important uh, to the overall economy. Uh, coronavirus obviously has done a lot of things, uh, et cetera. So probably not, not the angle that I would be, be starting in. Another common argument, uh, which those of you who debated immigration will be be aware of is the deterrence DA. Uh, and the idea behind this is just that we need to scare people away from migrating to the United States. Um, for the AF perspective, uh, this should be an easy way to win. Uh, we don't need to leave children caring for other children in prison without diapers and medical care uh, in order to scare people away from the United States. Uh, and the moral high ground that the affirmative has that we talked about from the beginning uh, definitely comes into play for this. I do think that the negative will win a few debates with, with this uh, by just having a common plan that fixes some of the problems with these deterrent centers, maybe stops doing family separations, provides more resources uh, to the people that, that are locked up, uh, building in transparency, and maybe restarting some of those Obama era initiatives for the uh, for Central American countries. Uh, but still, uh, that might weaken the link a little bit become even more problematic for the from the negative perspective. Uh, the state's counter plan is something that a lot of teams will will probably read um, well as long along with elections or some politics DA. I'm not uh, I'm not really sure what the elections link will look like uh, but the state's counter plan is a very this is a very interesting topic for the sake of federalism. Uh, last year the um, in September, California passed legislation that closed private prisons in the state uh, with the thought being that it would 
uh, include ICE detention facilities. Um, but it did just the opposite uh, in some ways because in November, ICE announced that they would still be using the beds and detention facilities uh, as a major rebuke to Governor Newsom uh, and that they would just call them temporary holding facilities and use other temporary holding facilities. Uh, they've also uh, just done a quite the number of new contracts uh, that went into effect in between the launching of uh, Newsom's law uh, and when it when it all broke down. Uh, so, a good back and forth, huge questions of federalism uh, that would be occurring uh, with this. Uh, so, uh, a debate that I look forward to judging uh, quite a few times. Uh, and then the last uh, big argument, I think. Uh, and one that will be will be solid. Uh, I think it will win uh, a good majority of the debate sites in uh, the two and R is the uh, is just the critique. Uh, this book, uh, Migrating to Prison uh, by Cesar Hernandez, uh, argues that immigrant advocates shouldn't be content themselves with simple debates about how many thousands of immigrants to lock up and other minor tweaks but instead looks at wholesale changes that are necessary to deal with the prison industrial complex, immigration law, uh, the, the idea of abolishing prisons is in, in total, uh, and we'll, we'll get quite a bit of offense uh, just predicated off of uh, the AFS general tinkering with the system rather than uh, having, having wholesale changes. So uh, it should be pretty interesting. Uh, these most of this stuff will be in the starter packet version of the the one I see that or the starter packet version of the Michigan files we'll have out uh, in a couple weeks. So uh, pretty excited, uh, something to look forward to. Uh, so, do we have any questions? Yeah. So, uh, first question we have here is. Why wouldn't a counter plan that reforms the immigration system to not link to the deterrence is that, or what reforms could be done to avoid um, the counter plan from linking to that net benefit? So I think that it would, it, there's probably a link differential in a few ways. Uh, first, just being like people are still locked up in these prisons when they get to the US. It might not be, uh, it might not be as bad as it was, but it's not, not nearly the, the end of, the, the end of the world. Um, so that's a interesting, so I think that the reforms that would happen though would just kind of go back to some of the Obama era policies uh, as well as stop uh, stop the forced, forced separations. Uh, does it solve the AF is the real question that you have to have. If the 1AC is just predicated on like, we have to stop this process of immigration, um, and locking people up for being in the country, does locking them up and putting them in better conditions like solve anything? Uh, so uh, something something kind of worth thinking about, but it'll be a counter plan that's read pretty often, I think. Um, maybe with you know an, a style that has like 80 different planks or has different courts do it. Um, so yeah. All right. Uh, the next question is a little bit of also a throwback to the immigration topic. Uh, then a question is, could the parole counter plan answer this AF? Yeah, I think parole would uh, would answer uh, huge portions of the AF. The AF might have some uh, permutation ground uh, just because if they do something like overrule Nielsen v. Preep, uh, they would, then it would basically, it would de facto be parole in that way. Uh, of not locking people up for immigration the immigration process. All right, uh, next, how can you make this topical under sentencing? If immigration cases go through an immigration court, could a team argue this isn't criminal sentencing reform? So I think that if we jump back to the slide from Justice Alito, um, because it changes the uh, sentencing requirements uh, for what people have done as a criminal act in the United States, which is just being here illegally as the criminal act, uh, then I think that you will have done the the necessary work to meet, meet sentencing. Uh, but I think this is, like I mentioned earlier, a little bit more evidence 
uh, in this debate would definitely be important to to sway it. If I was if I was reading this app, I would probably spend the bulk of my time uh, before the first tournaments of the year figuring out my two AC to set up the sentencing stuff. Um, okay, so I'll actually ask you and uh, give you another follow up question to that, which is, does the AF if the AF solves the conditions of immigration detention centers, do you think that is topical, um, or whether, or do you think it has to reform the actual sentencing or police? Like, can, can that fall within reforming sentencing and policing? Uh, probably both. Um, like, I don't know if you could necessarily just be like, we've we have ended these prison detention centers and not have an intersection with policing or sentencing in any way, um, just because that would be your your 2AC we meet to to a topicality argument. But um, addressing one of them head on is probably the better way to go. Um, okay, so next question. Uh, how is the literature on crimmigration and the intersection between criminality and immigration? What other AFs um, in this area, do you think could deal with this concept? Uh, so the criminalization debate is obviously a, a pretty interesting one. Um, and I think that if, if you are interested in reading an AF that relates to uh, criminalization, I would read this, uh, this Hernandez book. Uh, I also have another book recommendation, uh, but I do not have my notes with me about it <laughs> that I would be happy to, to share with that person. If you want to shoot me an email at F-I-F-E-L-S-K-I at umich.edu. I could send you plenty of sources uh, on that topic. Um, okay, so the next question, uh, if you were a 2A putting together this app, which combination of advantages would you be most likely to choose? I think that I would probably just read the, these are morally abhorrent uh, conditions AF and leave it at that. Um, maybe, maybe an advantage about having moral high ground with, with China. But I feel like the more knowing how much I think the the K will be in the two and R in debates, I, I would probably want to limit my amount of verbiage about U.S. supremacy or leadership uh, to a minimum and just make this F about pragmatism of these things are really bad. Uh, we should we should stop using them. Um, but you know, if you want to, you want to have fun with it. And there, you know, come camp, there will be, I'm sure there'll be plenty of labs around the country that write this AF with a bunch of big stick, a uh, bunch of big stick advantages that just allow the affirmative to collapse. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see. Uh, I'm particularly interested in what the terrorism advantage will look like uh, in many forms, just because it turns out that if you lock people in prison uh, unjustly, they they might be angry by the time they they grow up. Um, so I'll actually jump off of another thing that you just mentioned, which is what do you think is the best basis for link ground uh, if you're going for the K against the SAF? Uh, so I think the, the best, much like the, the abolishment K that we, we've talked about in other lectures, um, I think that is kind of where you would want to start. Just like, look, the affirmative tinkers with immigration law but doesn't do anything to fix it. Right? These are the people that come into the United States and uh, are here illegally, still don't have the right to work legally. They don't have proper, you know, they, they don't have access to healthcare. Uh, right now, when everybody around the country is getting these $1,200 checks, immigrants aren't. Um, so, you know, there's, there's some things to think about with that. And just like the idea that we can just fix one thing and the immigration system solved, uh, really whitewashes a lot of the problems. Uh, so that's kind of where I would, that's where I would have the foundation of my, my link arguments. Um, okay, so next question. Um, do you think solvency or circumvention is a major weakness for this AF? I do think that there's probably some issue of circumvention um, just because these, these companies have a lot of pull and uh, legislatively, and like this article uh, on the right even uses the word circumvents in the the tag or not the tag, the title of the article, which is you know almost a dream for us in debate. 
to, to find that, but a well-worded plan text that just makes these facilities impossible to use uh, probably gets around most of those circumvention issues. Uh, as for just like regular old solvency questions, uh, I think that if it, if it does enough to stop people from going into these detention facilities, uh, then it will, it will solve. Uh, maybe there's a sliding scale argument that the AF would want to make, but it generally it should be in pretty good shape. So given that, what do you think an ideal plan text looks like or a sort of sample, you know, things to include in the plan text uh, or not include in order to maximize solvency and avoid those circumvention arguments? The United States Supreme Court should overrule its decision in Nielsen v. Preep on the grounds that um, Section C of U.S. Code 1228, I think it is, um, is not a viable understanding of detention or sentencing, something along those lines. Um, I, I am kind of surprised in the amount of stuff that's been written about these immigration detention centers. There's not more people writing about ways to close them through the, the legal process. Um, there are calls for like congressional action, so you could just be like the USFG should uh, augment sentencing and or policing, or I guess not and or, and policing rules for criminal justice reform in these ways uh, that would get you access. But I definitely think the court is the actor that I would want to read um, with these apps. Um, so the next question asks if you could elaborate a little bit more on what the federalism debate looks like in this area. I don't know if the federalism debate looks like something that's all that interesting to us in policy debate uh, as much as it's just like ac academically in, in reality an interesting uh, federalism debate. Um, if states don't have the ability to control what's happening on their, in their territory, um, that's a pretty, pretty big blow. Like when this bill passed in California, uh, it was, it was monumental in a lot of ways. Um, and the fact that the Trump administration found a way to just squash that initiative um, by just having some loopholes uh, just kind of shows that they're not really interested in states, states' rights. Um, okay, so the next question, um, what do you think the best policy strategies are against this, against this F? Um, and we kind of talked about the K already a little bit. Um, I'm kind of curious for your thoughts about the the best neg strategies for policy arguments. You know, I imagine it will be um, similar to some of the, the other topics where there's been a soft left F that solves a great deal, um, which will be some pretty bad disad um, about the courts taking it or the Supreme Court taking action and a counter plan that just has lower courts do it or state courts or states, um, but it competes off of a pretty contrived net benefit. Um, I'm thinking even, you know, speaking of Nielsen, the Nielsen DA from, I think it was the immigration topic is kind of the perfect example of that. Uh, you know, and 2020 will be up until November. I think 2020 will be a huge DA. I'm not sure what the link story necessarily looks like. My guess is it's, you know, the plan, plan makes Trump look good. Uh, that wins over, wins him some voters in purple states. Um, and, but that's probably the best route between those, those few options. Uh, but if I was, if I thought I was going to debate this half a bunch, I would prep the K in topicality. Okay. Um, I will, give you one more question unless anyone else has something else to add here. Um, I will, the last question I'll ask is, what do you think uh, the, do you think that there is a good way to answer a counter plan that uh, has the states or has the federal government give the state's authority to prohibit those detention centers? Uh, so the answer there I think would be, uh, an argument or just a theory argument about fiat because you would not only have the the federal government devolve authority to the states uh, but then you would also have to have fiat the states take some uniform action to pass uh, pass laws or do whatever they want to do to close 
these de detention centers and, or you just have a solvency deficit. There's places like Louisiana and Alabama that would never close these facilities and ICE would then just move people across the country to them. Uh, when some states have tried uh, initiatives like California's before and ICE has just moved, has literally put those people into trucks and moving them across state, state lines and uh, put them in other detention facilities. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing uh, all of your research and your thoughts about the immigration area of the topic. Um, and thank you to everyone who uh, watched and who gave who gave us some great questions to to think about. Um, and we look forward to uh, doing some more webinars and hope to see you all there and you know get some more great questions and provide some additional. Uh, information about the topic uh, as we prepare for the 2020 Michigan online debate camp. Uh, thank you all so much for attending um, and have a great night. Thanks everybody.